In a single move, I pulled off his blanket, tore off his underclothes, and threw myself at him. He shouted, what the hell, and started to move away, but I wrapped myself around his body and hissed, you're staying right where you are, mister. You're not going to call me those names and get away with it. I'll show you what a piece of ass Ron's girl was. I'll show you who it is you're calling a child molester. I'll make you eat those words until you throw up. I clung to him with all my might until he stopped trying to move away. Then I started caressing him, crawling all over him, kissing and licking and biting him everywhere. When he came, I didn't let him pause for a second, but kept right on going. I didn't even let myself pause when I came. There's only one person in this whole house that I ever wanted to molest, I told him, and that person has a prick and is not a little girl. He came again, and still I didn't let up. I wanted you since the day you took me on the tour, I said, and I wanted you badly, the way only a woman who loves men can want a man. You're terribly wrong about me, Jose. I never made love to Tina. I never dreamed of it. I know why you suspect me. I learned about Tissy and Sabina only tonight, but you're wrong about me. I want you, Jose. Only you. He came again. At last he begged me. Please, Sophie, no more. I can't. And fell to sleep exhausted. Only then did I stop. I lay back proudly. I had won. The sun was starting to come up. As I lay on the pillow I shared with Jose, I heard Sabina walk through the hall to her room. I realized why Tissy had chosen that night. Was Sabina returning from a job or from an all-night orgy at her friend's mattress apartment? I no longer cared. I was proud of myself and felt completely relaxed. I fell asleep perfectly satisfied, even happy. I woke up with Jose's lips on mine. He was sitting by me, all dressed. It must have been noon. You really are some woman, he whispered. Jose's woman, I asked. He asked, what was all that about last night? I told him, without a trace of my former anger, everything I knew about Ted and Tina. The only comment he made was in defense of Ted. If it wasn't for Ted, the kid would be on heroin right now and probably going out every night to. You don't believe me, I exclaimed. I believe everything you said, but you don't know Tissy or Seth, he said. What do they have to do with it, I asked. How about just forgetting last night, he suggested. I looked for nothing better. I forgot immediately and continued forgetting year after year. You going bus riding again, he asked. If you stay in this room all day, I'll stay, I told him. If you leave, I'll follow you wherever you go. If you won't let me, I'll cling to you. So you really mean it, he asked. Mean what? Jose's girl, he said. Woman, I corrected. Ron's girl, Jose's woman. You're as crazy as Sabina, he said. Of course, we're twins, I exclaimed. What else do you know about her? She once gave me the same shock you did, he said. With Tissy, I asked. With Tissy, he said. Ron never told me anything about Sabina. She's stiff as a board, he once said, but I didn't believe him. She don't look like a board. You're twins for looks. When we started here, Sabina's looks drove me batty. I told her. Her room's always been right there, right across from mine. That night she left her door open. She and Tissy. I didn't believe it. What else do you know? I asked. She left her door open again the next night, and the night after that. Anything else? I asked, turning my face away from his. Jose's tone changed. She's terrific. There's no one like her. Without her, this place would have collapsed a month after we started. What about you? I asked. She's the brains, he said. I'm just her flunky. She's got all the ideas. She's the one who works them all out. And she's always the first to try it out and see if it works. Like I said, she's terrific. So are you, I said, kissing him. Let anyone say there's something wrong with Sabina, and I'll send him to see the sky, he continued. She's no twin of yours, Sophie, but once you stop asking her to be that, you see that she's got no twins. She's in a class all her own. That Sabina is on the ball like no one I ever met. And she's no bored. Ron wanted the one thing she couldn't give him. And Tina, I asked. You tell me, he said. Breakfast, I suggested. Jose threw a robe over me and carried me to the kitchen. I was happier than I'd been since my first bicycle trip with Ron. This is my world, I thought. I agreed with you. I had completely forgotten everything that had happened the previous night. I found myself when I had risen from the rug, resolved to win Jose, but I lost myself as soon as I won him. I immersed myself in him, annihilated myself, became Jose's shadow. I got up when he got up, ate my meals with him, spent the morning with him in the garage, the afternoon in the workshop, the evening on a walk or ride. We washed together, laughed together, worked together, slept together. I ceased being Sophia even in my own eyes. I was Jose's woman. And I was happy, not only at the beginning, but to the very end. I was accepted, I was loved, and I was an apprentice again. I stopped worrying about anyone else. I left Tina to Ted. I left Vic to Seth. 
I didn't tell you about that. You didn't miss much. I left Sabina to Tissy, and I left both of them to their buyers. The house did indeed consist of nothing but couples. I was overjoyed to be one of them. The destruction of my happiness began with a phone call from Alec. Hello, Sophie. I'm really sorry about the way I acted, what I said. I don't ever want to see you again, I shouted into the phone. Please, Sophie, don't hang up, he pleaded. Minnie and the others, they're dying to see you. What for, I asked. To preach about heroin and prostitution? I don't want to hear about it. I said I was sorry, Sophie. No, I told them about the school and all that. About street people running their own activities and about the things you learn to do. Hugh was really impressed. He said he's been thinking about getting involved with something like that. Minnie was impressed, too. And you know, Damon, but he wants to see you, too. He and Minnie broke up, you know. Really? I asked. How's he getting along by himself? I don't know, Alec answered. I only talked to him on the phone. You know, I've been thinking a lot about all those things your sister said, about selling all my time by going to that job every morning. I think she's right, and it really bothers me. Quit, I advised him. Easily said. That's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. Is it all right if we come over, he asked. Quit first, I said stupidly, thinking I was throwing him a challenge he couldn't meet. How about a week from Sunday, he asked. I hung up without answering. I was sure I'd heard the last of Alec. I quickly forgot that I talked to him. I rejoined Jose at the work he was doing. I fetched tools for him, oiled machines, cleaned parts, held bolts in place. I was Jose's woman. My newspaper staff friends were the last people in the world I wanted to see. But all four of them showed up at the garage a week from Sunday. Vic let them in and Ted escorted them to the kitchen. When they entered, Alec was slapping Ted on the back, telling him, I understand your point about the heroin, but I was sane. Minnie walked up to me and shook my hand coldly. I suppose you never will forgive us for that omissions. Oh, that, I said. What an appropriate name. I almost forgot it. You're right. I never will forgive you. Hugh made no reference to it. He only said, Good to see you again, Sophie. Alex said you're doing some exciting things here. He shook my hand politely. Damon neither shook my hand nor said anything. He just sat down. I suppose that his breakup with Minnie meant that he lost both his will and his voice. I felt sorry for him. Alex started to make introductions. This is Ted. The girl is Tina. There's also Tissy and Sabina, but I guess they're not up yet. And over there, Ron, is it? I flew across the room toward Alex, shouting, Ron, what kind of a joke is that? Who the hell told you about Ron? Your mother, Alec answered contritely. Your mother, Jose asked. Sabina told me years ago she was dead. I just talked to her a week ago, Alec insisted. She's still waiting for your phone call. What else did you tell her, I asked. Christ, I don't know. I mentioned your sister, he admitted. My sister? You ran to her to tell her about... I started. Jesus, Sophie, you didn't want me telling her what you told me to tell her, he asked desperately. Tina and Ted had been cluttering the table with bread, cheeses, and beer, and at this point they invited all of us, hosts and guests, to join them at lunch. I lost interest in Alec and sat down next to Jose. Everyone started eating. Minnie broke the silence. I understand you run a school here. A school? Jose exclaimed. We run a school? I've never once been to school, ever, Tina contributed. But that's what Alec told me, Minnie insisted. Was he misinformed? Alec looked helplessly at me, but I ignored him, so he ventured out on his own. I said it was sort of a school, Minnie, but it's not called a school. People learn things here, but it's not structured. What I mean is, at least that's how I understand it. Just then, Sabina and Tizzy came in together. Alec looked relieved, but only for a second. Well, well, the reverend, Sabina said with mock enthusiasm. Don't let me interrupt you, reverend. Your sermon is fascinating. Then, imitating Alec's inflection, what I mean is, at least that's how I understand it, simply fascinating. May I also suggest, you know, I was about to say, from my point of view, on the other hand, if you see what I mean, please do go on, reverend. Alec sulked. I wasn't saying anything much, but I'm not a reverend anymore. I handed in my resignation over a week ago, and yesterday was my last day at work. I smiled at Alec. He'd taken up my challenge after all. So you've left the millions of citizens behind and joined the criminals, Sabina exclaimed. Alec was visibly disappointed by the meager congratulations he received for his courageous act, and he sulked in silence. Minnie took the opportunity to resume her quest. She turned to Sabina and said, Maybe you'd be so kind as to answer my questions. Sabina looked Minnie up and down, smiled, and asked, Do you happen to be employed by the police department? Minnie glanced at me for help that I wasn't about to provide, and she continued on her own. I understand that you're all indigenous to the inner city, so-called street people. 
And you being abroad from the suburbs would like to know how it feels to be screwed in the inner city, Sabina butted in. Minnie turned to Tissy next and demanded indignantly, Is it possible to talk to any of you? Who the hell are you, Tissy fired back. What the fuck do you want to know so badly, Jose asked. Minnie whispered something to Hugh, and Hugh turned to Jose. Alec gave us an interesting account of your establishment, your house. We found many of the features admirable, but we would like to clarify certain points. What points? Jose asked, the hostility mounting in his voice. We are puzzled by the question of the financing, Hugh continued. You the judge? Jose asked. Excuse me, the what? Hugh asked. Are you the judge? Jose asked again, emphasizing each word. Are we on trial? When the hell were we arrested? At this point, Damon spoke for the first time. Well, I guess we better be shoving along. Hugh got up and shook my hand politely again, and again said, It was good to see you, Sophie. Minnie got up and leered at Alec. Gee, Alec, you said these people were friendly. I've seen friendlier people. They're convinced we're all cops. Even Sophie acts as if she'd never known us. The way out is that way, shouted Jose, pointing. Ted and Tina accompanied them out, three of them. Alec remained seated at the kitchen table. Tissy burped at Alexandra and went back to her room. Alec turned to Sabina, pleading and contrite, his eyes focused on her hands. I wanted to apologize for the way I looked at you last time. I know that can be insulting. I wanted to tell you I quit my job because of all those things you told me. You were right. I was a wage slave, a coward. I, what I wanted to ask was, is there anything I might be able to do around here? Sabina was stunned. You, a professor? Jose nudged me to see if I was ready to return to the workshop. I was. As we walked out of the kitchen, I heard Alex saying, you're perfectly right. I don't know how to do anything at all. I'm a complete ignoramus. But I really want to try to learn. If I could start as a mechanic. Jose and I finished a project we had started before lunch, and we took the rest of the day off. We came back exhausted after a long car ride and walk in the country. The following morning, I felt sick to my stomach when I entered the garage and saw Tina and Ted explain the workings of a car engine to Alec. The next time I saw Sabina, I complained angrily to her. How could you invite that, that idiot? He invited himself, she said calmly. We've never turned anyone away when we've had a spare room. And the first time we do, it'll be the end. You know perfectly well that's not a spare room, I hissed. It's Ted's room. Sabina turned and walked away from me. I didn't raise the question again. I stayed with Jose, but the atmosphere grew tense. One afternoon, Alec caught me alone in the garage. Ted and Tina were in their lofts, and Jose had gone downstairs to look for a part. Alec edged towards me. I hardly recognize you as the person I once knew, Sophie. Then act as if you never knew me, I said. There's all that talk about doing your own activities, he started. Why did you stay here? What do you want, I asked. I want to be close to you, if you really want to know, he said. It looked to me like you were panting for Sabina with your tongue hanging out, I said. I'll get off it, Sophie. Ted told me all about, he started. So that leaves only me, doesn't it? We followed Rhea into the party and we followed Sophie out. We followed Sabina down to a sewer. And who do we run into if not Sophie? But it's too late, Alec. It's way too late for anything like that. What does that mean, he asked. I'm Jose's woman, I said proudly. Nah, Sophie, Jesus Christ, that's not you. That's not anyone I ever knew, he said, and I heard him. I was stung. You're not that guy's woman. You're his rug, his cigarette lighter, his messenger, his pet. Christ, Ted's been telling me about the dope and the whorehouse, and that's bad enough, but that's nothing compared to what's been happening to you. I don't know what happens to people on heroin, but it can't be any worse than what you've got. You've lost your whole personality. You're that guy's dog. I ran from Alec and headed for the workshop to be near Jose. He noticed my tears and asked if anything had happened. He told me he was only staying here because of me, I said. He's jealous of you. I don't blame him, Jose said. Jose, I cried, please make him leave. I can't do that, Sophie, he said. The guy says he's got no place to go and we've got space. Can't just tell him to leave. If he wanted to start his own garage, we could help him like we did last year with that one kid. Jose, I pleaded, I was so happy until he came. So was I, Sophie, he said. I mean, I still am happy. I don't see what, that he should ruin anything. He's not a bad guy, you know. If you're through with them, tell him. If you're not, well, you're your own person, is what Sabina always says. Jose, I said, crying, remember when you said Sabina was terrific, that there was no one else like her? Well, there's no one else like you, I bawled. You're more terrific than she is. I fell into Jose's powerful arms and he held me and pressed me, as if I were his rug, his cigarette lighter, his pet. And that's all I was. I couldn't stop bawling because I knew Alec was right. I had one more encounter with Alec before everything caved in. 
It was on a Wednesday morning. One morning each week, on a Wednesday, Jose had an errand on which I didn't accompany him. He asked me not to, and I didn't pry. I didn't learn a great deal about Jose during my stay with him, nor he about me. We never asked. There were too many things we didn't want to talk about. I didn't pry into his few secrets, and he didn't once ask me what Alec had been to me during my university days. On all previous Wednesday mornings, I had stayed in our room, or gone for a walk, waiting for Jose to return from his secret errand. But that morning I went into the garage. I had decided to settle the question of Alec on my own. The three of them, Alec, Ted, and Tina, were working by themselves, each on a different project. I walked right up to Alec. He stopped what he was doing and stared at me. His face looked sad, but I was determined. Why don't you leave this place, mister, I told him firmly. You don't belong here. You're not like us. Tina and Ted both stopped working and looked at me, waiting. Jesus, what did I do now? Alec asked, hanging his head. You're still here. That's what you did now, I snapped. Tina butted in with a barely audible, Sophia, you've got no right. Stay out of this and mind your own boyfriend, Tina, I snapped. You're the one who has no right. Tina started to sob. Sophie, listen to me, Alec said slowly. It's you who've got to leave this place. You're the one that doesn't belong here. Don't you see what's happening? You're sick. Don't you see that? You just watch who you're calling sick, mister, I snapped. Have you ever looked at yourself? You're disgusting. We're here for life. Why are you here? For a broad? You don't know what life is, mister, because broads are all you've got on your brain. To spend week after week crawling on the floor and greasing your arms up just on the chance that she'll come to you. That's what I call sick, mister. Real sick. I'm going to leave soon, Sophie, he announced, his anger mounting. But not before trying to make you see what you're turning yourself into. I know for a fact that you don't know shit about what happens here. I've watched you. Whenever anything comes up, you stick your head up your ass. You hide out inside that boyfriend of yours, or husband or father, or whatever the hell he is to you. Well, I've picked up a few clues, and you're going to hear them, like it or not. Ted can bear me out. Who do you think pays for the great school of yours and that great love affair? You don't think it's the piddling we do around here, do you? Allow me to straighten you out before I leave. It's your sisters and Tissy's whoring that pays for that expensive house and all the food and the three cars and all that expensive shit that's displayed in every room. And your boyfriend's pimping. That's right. That's the name for it. Pimping. But with all they take in, they can't pay for all of it. What with Sabina having her own expensive hobbies and Tissy her heroine. And this piddling around with all the newest machinery doesn't even pay for its own costs. This garage stopped supporting itself before you ever came here. Ted stopped stealing when it dawned on him he was supporting a narcotics depot. For a while he just took the cars apart, but he didn't want other people working for him either, so he helped them set up their own garage. Nothing comes in here anymore except the junk they can't get rid of at the other garage. What do you think pays for all this shit? Just Seth's heroin. And Seth is figuring out that he doesn't want to carry all that ballast. Yeah, ballast. Dead weight. All he wants is his boyfriend, Vic. He needs Ted as a front, and he needs your friend part-time for the contacts. But he doesn't need you, or me, or the kid, or 99 out of every 100 machines here. And he's getting ready to dump all that. What do you do when he starts dumping? You tell me, Sophie. Learn to steal cars? You can't even steal cigarettes from supermarkets. Get a job? A year at the highest paying job wouldn't pay for one of the machines that's here. What do you do then, Sophie? Stick your head up your ass? You tell me. Swinging my whole arm, I whacked Alex on his cheek and ran to my room. I confronted Jose as soon as he returned. Alec has to go, Jose. I can't stand being in the same house with him. Jose fidgeted. I don't know what to say, Sophie. I thought that got worked out. I thought you two kept away from each other. I can't stand it, I repeated. How about a trip, he asked, brightening. A long trip all over this continent, just you and me. I smiled, just Jose and his woman. Then I asked, who'd pay for it? You know Sabina would help us out, he said without hesitating. Jose, I said, I don't want to go on Sabina's money. We don't have much of our own, he said. I want to go on my own money. I can get at least as much as Sabina does, and maybe more. It'll be a better trip if we go on my money, I insisted. That's up to you, Sophie, he said sadly. I'm my own person, I said. That's right, Sophie. You're your own person, Jose said, walking out of the room. I ran out after him and slipped my arm into his. I tried to smile. It's just talk, Jose. You know that, don't you? It's all just talk. Jose's woman is a big talker, but she doesn't ever do the things she talks about. She doesn't care whose money it is, and she doesn't want to take a trip. She's not going to start working, and she really doesn't care who lives here. All Jose's woman wants is to be loved by her man. I can't tell you what happened during the days or weeks that followed. I don't even know if it was days or weeks or months. Jose and Sabina clashed with Alec and Ted once, perhaps several times. I think one of them hit the other, but I don't remember. I don't think this is an incident of repressed memory. I think I didn't register anything at the time. 
There was nothing to repress. All I remember is eating with Jose, working with him, sleeping with him, loving him and being loved by him. The first event I remember took place on my last day in the garage. It must have been a Sunday morning. I was working. There was a terrible amount of noise. I was vaguely aware that Minnie, Hugh, and Damon were in the garage. Everyone I knew was in the garage. All of them seemed to be talking at the same time. I didn't know how long they'd been there. Minnie was shouting about the desire for money and the desire for power over underlings. Sabina was shouting about moralizing high school teachers who dreamed of being dictators. I ignored them and turned the grinder on to sharpen my chisel. Jose put his hands on my shoulders and said, Your friends came to visit you too, Sophie, not just Alec. They're not my friends, Jose, I said calmly. Make them leave. They're not your friends either. I heard Alec whisper to Minnie, You see what I mean? I went on grinding until I was done. Minnie continued her argument with Sabina. My moralizing, as you call it, never had that effect on a human being. Look at her. It's awful. Did you know what she was like before she came here? She was the liveliest intellect in the university. Alex swears you don't keep her on drugs, but I don't believe it. How else could you have gotten her into the state she's in? Shame on you. Your own sister. And what have you done to your own intellect? You've chained it to serve your boundless lust. How can you justify your crimes? You say you're a part of a process of change, and it sounds so good because that everyone wants that but a change for the better, not for the worse. Why do you leave that question out? I know why. That world-changing process you claim to be part of is nothing but your own deranged ambition. You'd like to change the world, all right, into an empire of lesbians. Sabina lunged at Minnie and pinned her back against the wall, but Minnie continued, You're nothing but a depraved, ruthless businessman, a millionaire aiming for billions, a lousy imperialist. You'll stampede over anything that stands in your way and destroy it. You'll turn your own sister into a mechanical doll, a grinning vegetable. Sabina whacked Minnie with her fist, and Minnie slid slowly to the floor, holding her cheek in both hands, whimpering. Sabina took hold of Minnie's shoulders, raised her up, and held her pinned against the wall. Now you listen to me, sister, she said with contempt. I'm no sister of yours, Minnie exclaimed, controlling her sobs. That's what I always thought, Sabina said. The first time I saw you, I knew you were a cop. How decent of you to admit it. A plain, simple cop, ruining no one's life, just keeping people happy. I'll tell you what's wrong with Sophia. She spent too many years being policed by cops like you. Missionaries, professors, policemen. You're the ones who took care of that lively intellect. You're the ones who chained it to your filthy uses. You might as well have pulled it out of her. You wound it so tightly around those so-called projects that aren't even your own that she lost all control over it. I stared at Sabina's back, spellbound, fascinated by every sound she made, horrified. By the time she came here, Sabina continued, she didn't know who or what she was. She had no mind of her own. She couldn't choose. She couldn't decide. Don't give us credit for that. You get all that credit. It's thanks to you that she trembled with fear when she came in contact with living people. It's thanks to you that she had nightmares when her imagination broke out of its prison. It's thanks to you that she broke down the moment she felt desire stirring inside her. She broke down because for the first time in her life she wasn't being policed. She broke down because she didn't know how to be her own person. When the police inside her were removed, there was nothing inside her to hold her up. You'd seen to that. You and your apparatus, your establishment, your school. You'd removed whatever was her, and you'd replaced it with the police. Don't tell me about a grinning vegetable, you mechanical doll. For the first time in her life, she's fighting not to be one, and she's going to win that fight. I felt like passing out, but stopped myself when I thought of Alec's comment about sticking my head up my ass whenever anything comes up. Everything inside me was coming up. As if in a dream, I heard Hugh start talking, calmly, politely. Why don't you let Minnie go now, Miss Natchelow? I'm sure she heard you. We all did. You're an eloquent speaker, very eloquent, and also very convincing. I don't think any of us, not even Minnie, would care to deny any part of your argument. We're all familiar to some extent with the destructive power of the institutions you describe. I think what's at issue here is the alternatives to those institutions. Two friends of ours, Alec and your sister, discovered such an alternative in this establishment, and I must admit that when Alec first told me about it, I was immensely impressed. So impressed that I've abandoned my studies and thrown myself into what I at first understood to be similar work. Hugh looked beautiful to me, exactly as he'd looked when he'd walked at the head of the funeral procession, carrying the coffin of our dead newspaper, wearing his black suit and his funny black hat. I remained impressed after our first visit, he continued. Unlike many, I wasn't antagonized by your hostility. On the contrary, I considered it a very healthy reaction against the intrusion of what you called missionaries, educators, and policemen. As soon as we left, I realized that was exactly what we were. 
You are perfectly right to eject judges who hold up the dominant institutions as the standard of human decency. I wanted to insert myself into a similar struggle, but unlike Alec, I didn't think it appropriate to oppose myself here. I hope I'm not boring you. I'm coming to the point as quickly as I can. I moved out of the university environment and into an area where the human consequences of our social order are less disguised, more visible. I don't live very far from here. Instead of frequenting university seminars, I began to frequent street corners, bars, and pool halls. I soon learned that you're right on yet another account. What you call a world-changing process is indeed taking place, and it is taking place precisely where you say it is, among those you call street people. I began to meet regularly with a group of those so-called street people. So you went to the jungle and started to preach to the natives, Sabina exclaimed sarcastically. Vampire, Minnie hissed, making a move towards Sabina. Please let me finish, Minnie, he begged. I'm just coming to the point. I learned that, at least in this neighborhood, your establishment has a certain reputation among the so-called street people. Your establishment is known. I became indignant. I thought that I'd been lied to and that Alec had been badly deceived, but I couldn't make myself believe what I saw and heard. That's why I responded with interest when Alec called Jose Bella. He called you here? I thought you just dropped in to see your friends. I'm sorry if I spoiled anything for you, Alec, Hugh said, and then continued addressing Sabina. What I've seen here confirms everything I've been told. Your establishment is as great an exploiter of this community as all the institutions you so eloquently condemn. And in many ways, it's worse. Under the guise of being an integral part of the rising community, you are in fact leeches on that community. You push it back down, sucking its strength out of it. You are incapacitating that community precisely at the moment when it is trying to raise itself up with its own strength. That fellow over there, he pointed to Seth, is known to your neighbors as one of the biggest heroin dealers in the entire area. The one behind him has a somewhat more modest reputation for similar accomplishments. You and your friend, I forget her name, are known locally as the regional Cleopatras. This fellow here, Sophia's companion, is known... Sabina's fists were both clenched. She started to move towards Hugh, but stopped when she saw Minnie lunging toward her. Sabina arched her back like a tigress. She would have sent Minnie tumbling to the ground if Alec hadn't jumped behind her and pinned her arms against her sides. Minnie's blow landed squarely in the middle of Sabina's face. Jose, who was considerably smaller than Alec, leaped at Alec and yanked him away from Sabina. Alec screamed at Jose, That's right, pimp, you protect her. That's what she's got you here for, protection. You're her henchman, her time server, her parasite, for protection and for fattening her pigs so she can sell them for a good price. Jose's blow sent Alec reeling across the room. There's only one parasite here, pretty boy, Jose shouted to Alec, and that's been you. You never learn to act without orders. You never learn what work is. You never learn that it's your motions and not the foreman's orders that make things move. Save your names for yourself. While Jose spoke, Damon was moving toward him, and Hugh took a step toward Alec, who lay on the ground near Seth. Both stopped abruptly. Seth stepped over Alec and pointed a gun at Hugh. Vic, behind Seth, pointed another at Damon. I screamed, not Hugh, I shouted, running across the room until my body touched the barrel of Seth's gun. Shoot me, not Hugh. He never did any harm to anyone. Seth pushed me to the floor. You, he ordered, aiming his gun at Hugh again and pointing the other hand at Alec. Pick him up and get him out of here. Quick, one, two, all of you. Shoo, scat, clear out. With both guns waving in their faces, Hugh, Damon, and Minnie all helped Alec to his feet and started moving toward the door. Hugh, I cried weakly, take me with you. Hugh looked uncertainly at Seth and then at Jose, but didn't take a step toward me. Take me, I pleaded, but Hugh continued to accompany Alec to the door. Seth jumped toward Hugh and poked him with his gun. You heard her, boss. Get her out, too. Step on it. The whole fucking lot of you. Hugh walked toward me. Sabina, Ted, Tina, even Jose didn't make a move. They looked like statues. Hugh picked me up in his arms and carried me out of the garage. I didn't leave on my own two feet. Hugh set me down on the ground as soon as we were outside. I noticed that Damon and Minnie were staring at me as if I was a circus freak. What are you two looking at, I asked. Haven't you ever seen a nitwit before? Get away from me. Go home. Damon walked reluctantly and slowly across the street, got into his car, and drove away. Minnie continued staring, seemed about to say something, and then rushed away on foot in the opposite direction. I turned to Hugh and said, Thanks a lot. I wouldn't have made it by myself. I'd like to see you again. Hugh scribbled his address on a piece of paper and walked away. I looked sadly at the garage and the shabby-looking building behind it. Then I started to walk away from both. I became aware that Alec was following me. I turned and shouted, Shoo, scat! Do you know where you're going? he asked. I screamed as loudly as I could. It's none of your fucking business. I turned and walked on. He was still behind me, though not as close as before. I tried to get rid of him for the second time. Leave me alone, stupid asshole. 
Do you think I've stopped being Jose's rug in order to become yours? I loved him the way I never loved you. Do you think I'm glad I left him? I know you forced me to do it. And listen to me, Alec. I'll hate you for that until the end of my life. Now get away from me. I walked again and thought I had shaken him off. I turned a corner just to make sure. And there he was, turning the corner at the other end of the street. I saw a bottle in the gutter, grabbed it, and ran toward him with it. He just stood where he was and waited. I didn't look at his face to see if it was sad or bewildered or angry. I stopped a few feet from him and hurled the bottle at his chest with all my might. You bastard, I screamed. You've got no right to take another person's life into your hands, no matter how bad you think it is or how good you think you can make it. You're the only real beast I've known in my whole life. I turned and ran from him. I ran until I convinced myself he was no longer following me. I sat down on a curb to rest before walking on. I walked all the way home. I mean home, to Louisa's. I knocked. I hoped Louisa was home. Over all the years when I hadn't once visited, I had always carried my key in my purse. But just then my purse was far away, in Jose's room. I would have let myself in through a window if she hadn't been home. I had, after all, become a criminal. Louisa opened the door and beamed. At least she seemed to find me recognizable enough. I embraced her with gratitude for that. Well, what a surprise, she shouted. Have room for me, I asked. The whole house, she exclaimed. I'll try to pay my way, I said. Are you crazy, she asked. It's your house as much as mine, and I've got more than twice as much food and money as I need. Yes, I am crazy, I answered. Do you mind? I only mind your asking if I mind, she answered. Same job, I asked. Unfortunately, she answered. Disappointed? I didn't answer. Boyfriends, I asked. Not this minute, she said. Can I go up to my room now and talk to you later, I asked. You can go wherever you please and you don't have to talk to me, she answered. But before letting me go, she threw her arms around me and kissed me. She had never done that for as long as I could remember. I ran up to my room, closed the door, and sat down on my familiar bed. I stared at the walls. They hadn't changed. They needed to be repainted. I felt lost, exactly as I'd felt once before, ten years earlier, when we first arrived. I didn't know where I was or why, and I didn't know what to do with myself in this big city. But one thing was different. I knew someone besides Louisa. There was one person in the city I wanted to be with. And you know why, Yaristan? You're going to ridicule me again, because he reminded me of you. Didn't you recognize yourself at all when I described him? I'm talking about Hugh. I thought about what he'd said a while earlier, and how beautifully he'd said it. You're incapacitating the community precisely at the moment when it is trying to raise itself up with its own strength. Compare that to this, from your newest letter. If we don't destroy the old life... If we don't project and begin to create a new life, then we're only going to reenact our slavery on the graves of our falling comrades. Down to the correctness and even the shyness. I had understood Hugh. What he stood for had been familiar to me. I had experienced it before. I looked forward to seeing him again. I remembered him as I'd known him on the newspaper staff, and I forgot everything that happened after I left the university until I saw him again. Forgot it, repressed it, stored it away. That wasn't familiar to me. And when I did that, did I really give up life and resurrect a corpse, as you put it? I sat on my bed and stared at the walls because I wasn't sure I hadn't made a horrible mistake. Not that I ever thought what you said, namely that my descent into the world of Tissy, Jose, and Sabina was a descent into your world. I loved you, Garistan, as I've loved very few people in my life. But my love for Jose was far, far away from your world or from mine, in a world all its own. That's why I sat and stared. I had been carried out of that underworld. I had left it behind. But I had left something down there, far more than my purse, my two started manuscripts, and my junky dresses. What I killed in myself wasn't a sequence of unpleasant or painful memories. I had to kill the joy together with the pain. I had to suppress my happiness. If I had allowed that to come back to life and become a vivid memory, even for an instant, I'd have run back to the house behind the garage, crawling and begging to be let in. Don't ever tell me that world is your world, Yaristan, or that you recognize yourself in Jose. If I'd had any basis to even suspect that from any of your letters, you wouldn't have received a mere letter from me. I would have flown to you twice as fast as a letter and torn you from Myrna and Yara, from your friends, your work, your world. If Myrna reads this letter, I hope she'll forgive me for expressing myself so crudely. I had to tell all of it or none of it. If I hadn't told you any of it, I couldn't have gone on corresponding with you. I couldn't bear your telling me how familiar the world of experience was to you precisely at the moment when Tina reminded me just how familiar it was to me. It was so familiar that when I emerged from it, I was ready to start all over again from a point I had reached ten years earlier. 
Yes, I erased it so forcefully that all the ten years that preceded it temporarily went down with it. All that remained was Hugh, and Hugh was someone I had known before I ever came here, in a carton factory. I hope none of you have your heads crammed with hackneyed notions about mental illness. There was no such thing in my life. I'm ill when an organ or a limb doesn't function. There was nothing at all wrong with my limbs or organs. Fortunately, there were no psychologists or mind doctors anywhere trying to heal what no one in the world has a right meddling with, my own life. And in this respect, Louisa was a perfect gem. On the evening of my first day home, she brought my supper up on a tray, exactly as she'd done for several days ten years earlier. She knocked lightly on the door, placed the tray on my desk, asked no questions, and left my room. I set my alarm, and the following morning, it was a Monday morning, I got up before Louisa left for work. I went downstairs to the kitchen, embraced her, and kissed her. I wanted to thank her for being such a gem. During that first week after my homecoming, Louisa and I were the best of friends, despite the fact that I told her nothing whatever about where I'd been or what I'd done. I didn't learn a whole lot about her either, but my conversations with her did help me sort out experiences I could safely remember from those I had to forget. I know you know where I've been, I told her provocatively, curious about how much she actually knew. With Sabina and that boy Ron, she said. You always thought Ron such a nice boy, didn't you, Louisa? Simply wonderful, she said. Every fascist household should have his picture on the wall. He's quite respectable now, you know, I said. He joined the mafia. Didn't Alec tell you that, too? Alec told me all about it, she said. He also told me to expect a phone call from you. Oh, that's right, I said. I told him I'd call. But I only told him that for his benefit. To fit into his idea of a dutiful daughter. You didn't sit up waiting, did you? I did think you'd call, Louisa said sadly. Come off that, Louisa. When did you ever become so sentimental, I asked. Did you really expect to hear my voice say, Hello, mother. This is your daughter. I'm over at Ron and Sabina's. I'm sure Alec would have called his mother, Louisa said. If she'd been alive, he certainly would have, I exclaimed. But if his mother expected such things from him, do you think he'd ever move back to her house? If she expected that, I'd have urged him to stay as far away from her as possible, she exclaimed. Both of us laughed. But when Louisa stopped laughing, she looked at me. Were you worried about me? I asked. They were worried. They wanted to call the police, she said. I'm glad you stopped them, I said. Who are they? Alec and his girlfriend, she said. Alec and who, I asked. I think her name is Minnie, she said. Minnie isn't Alec's girlfriend, I said. At least, I don't think she is. Really, she asked. They came together the first time. The first time, I asked. You mean they both came again? After my experience with Ron, I had kept my home and my friend's world apart and was disappointed by my lack of success. Only Alec, she answered. He's a very nice person. He's what I call a fascist, I snapped. How can you praise Ron to the sky and yet say that Alec, she started. I don't want to hear about Alec, I snapped. Tell me about your friends. I used to visit an old revolutionary exile every week. A kind, well-read, generous man, she said. What happened? You broke up, I asked, too offhandedly. He died a year ago, she said sadly. Poor Louisa, I thought. She's so completely alone, with nothing in her life but her job. I realized just how lonely she was toward the end of that week. I had decided to go visit Hugh. Louisa came home while I was eating supper. I think it was Friday night. I'm going out tonight, I said. With Ron again, she asked. Yes, with Ron, I said. Suddenly she started crying. What's wrong, I asked. Does Ron upset you that much? No, it has nothing to do with you, she said. Something at your job, I asked. Nothing ever happens at my job, she bawls. Our lives get eaten up for no reason. I'm no good to anyone, Sophia. No one needs me. I vaguely remember telling you about this scene before. I'll try not to repeat myself. I tried to console her, but didn't really know what to say. I suggested she started dating one or several of the men she knew at work, whether or not they were married. They're all hateful, she said. Why don't you invite your friends over? All right, I said, and then added sarcastically, pointlessly, I'll bring Ron home. She said, it's your house, Sophia, and your life, but if you ever bring him in here again, be sure I don't know about it. I mean your nice friends, Minnie and Alec and the others they mention. Invite them yourself, I snapped. Here are their phone numbers. It's your house and your life, but if you ever bring them in here, be sure I don't know about it. I left her sobbing. I resented her hostility toward my dead Ron. I resented her hostility toward my dead Ron, but I felt sorry for her at the same time. She was so starved for friendship, for affection, for love, and I had absolutely nothing to give her. I took a bus to Hugh's neighborhood, my former neighborhood, and found his apartment. I rang, knocked, waited, but no one came. I walked around the streets. I had stupidly put on one of Louisa's dresses, and I regretted that now. It was a rough neighborhood. I had never noticed just how rough. I returned to the apartment, and still no one answered. 
I went out again the following night, Saturday night, to look for Hugh. But as soon as I walked out of my house, I noticed a familiar car across the street and a familiar face inside it, Alex. He got out of the car as soon as he saw me and started to head toward me. I turned and ran back into the house. Louisa was in the kitchen, eating. I tiptoed through the house and slipped out by way of a back window. I failed to find Hugh, and I left him a note begging him to call me. I waited the whole next week for his call. On the following Saturday, I resolved to look for him again. That day, I had another surprise. During that week, I became increasingly depressed as I waited for Hugh to call, whereas Louisa became increasingly exhilarated. Finally, on Saturday morning, I asked her what had changed so suddenly in her life. I have a date tonight, she said, and I invited him to come here. Do you mind? Mind, I shouted. I think that's great. Are you going anywhere tonight, she asked apprehensively. Oh, don't worry about me, I said flippantly. I'll probably be out all night. Is he someone from work? Is he nice? I'd rather not tell you, she said. I didn't ask. Louisa spent most of the day preparing a very special meal and the rest of it dressing. I helped her clean the whole house. She put candles in the kitchen and candles in the living room. Before I left that evening, I taunted her. Why have you kept yourself in a closet all these years, Louisa? She blushed. You hussy, do I look all right, she asked, twirling in front of me. You're beautiful, I exclaimed. You're ravishing. Why, if you and I walked the streets together, you could quit your job and we could... Sophia, she said indignantly. Shocked, I asked. Coming from you, yes. Are you seeing Ron again, she asked. No, I said. I'm going to a movie, alone. And you're staying out all night, she asked sadly. She was shocked. I had forgotten what I had told her earlier. I'd rather not tell you, I said, imitating her. But don't mind me. Whenever I'll come in, I'll run straight upstairs without looking left or right. I kissed her to apologize for my inconsistent lies and whispered, Have a good time, hussy. I walked out of the house in my jeans, denim shirt, and Louisa's leather jacket. I looked back and saw her standing in the doorway. She smiled. She really did look ravishing and so happy. When I reached Hugh's apartment, my heart missed a beat. The note I had left him was still under his door. I bit my lip for having spent the whole week waiting for the phone to ring. I could have come the day after I left the note and learned that he no longer lived there. I kicked myself for not having come the first time until so many days after he'd given me his address. But then I started to wonder if he'd ever lived there, if for some mysterious reason he'd given me the wrong address. I rushed away from Hugh's unoccupied apartment. I had an intense desire to return to my room, but remembered Louise's date. I went to a movie, but the film was so awful I couldn't sit through it. I took a bus home. Less than two hours had passed since I'd left Louisa standing in the doorway. She and her date would be just finishing her special supper. Perhaps he'd take her out. I stopped caring about Louisa's date. I wanted to reach my room. I opened the door quietly, and as soon as I closed it, I sensed that the two lovers were locked in a tight embrace on the living room couch. I tiptoed to the staircase and stopped. I heard a terribly familiar voice whispering, Jesus Christ, Louisa, I thought she wouldn't be coming in. I ran up the stairs. Louisa ran to the staircase and pleaded, I'm sorry, Sophie, I wasn't expecting you so soon. I heard Alex say weakly, Hi, Sophie. I told you don't mind me, I shouted as I slammed my door. I sat on my bed trembling, blinded by rage. So that was her date. That unspeakably unscrupulous bastard to gorge himself with all those years of that love-starved woman's pent-up desire solely out of spite against me. Only a week earlier she described herself as a useless old rag, squeezed drier every day. I'm no good to anyone. No one needs me. With what blind, what mindless hunger had she become a willing instrument of Alec's revenge? With what deluded longing had she given away so much love to requite his mere spite? Poor Louisa. She had wanted me to bring my nice friends home. I knew I wouldn't be able to face Louisa again. I knew I'd kill her if I told her the truth, and if I said nothing, she'd read it on my face. As soon as I heard the door of Louisa's bedroom close, I started to pack a small bag. I had so pitifully little to pack. I walked downtown and napped uncomfortably on the bus station. In the morning, I found a cheap room and paid a week's rent with almost all the money Louisa had given me. The room had roaches as well as mice. I couldn't stand to stay in it during the day and went back to the bus station. Nor did I sleep well in my room that night but I was definitively on my own for the first time in my life. I could forge my own life, guided only by my own lights. And what did I make of myself on my own? Exactly what almost everyone else does. I got up nearly every Monday morning, bought a newspaper, and read the job advertisements. The only ones I circled were ones that said no experience required. If I told anyone I was a crack mechanic or welder, he would have laughed, and I couldn't have proved it. I walked until my feet were sore. I filled forms and answered ridiculous questions. By mid-afternoon, I had found a job which I would start the following morning. Since I wouldn't get my first pay for two weeks, I asked for an advance, 
telling the personnel man that I was out of food money. He pulled a bill out of his wallet saying, pay me back in two weeks, miss. I worked in a fiberglass factory. It was awful. If I've ever had a bad experience in my life, it was that job. I don't understand why people put up with that. I won't describe it to you now. It was only then, after my first week of wage labor, that I was really a zombie, a vegetable. By the following Sunday, I was so tired that I slept until mid-afternoon. My whole body ached when I dragged myself out of bed. I left my room, walked mechanically to the bus stop, and rode to my former neighborhood. I approached the address Hugh had given me as sullenly as I'd walked toward the fiberglass factory every morning that week. I knocked and rang from habit. I perked up with expectation when a woman opened the door. I asked about Hugh. She'd never heard of him. I dragged myself along every street in the area, every street but one. I studied the names listed on every apartment house, the names on all mailboxes and on the doors of small houses. I walked into every open store and looked through the display window, mail slot or keyhole of every closed one. It had been dark for at least two hours when I reached a door that said Project House in roughly painted letters. I tried the door. It was open. The room was full of boys and men, my age or younger, all rough looking, all street people. With my jeans, my hair in a cap, and Luisa's leather jacket, I didn't attract any attention. I was merely another one of them, maybe younger and not quite rugged enough. I looked from one unfamiliar face to the next and recognized Hughes. I realized that Hugh had seen me the minute I'd walked in but hadn't taken a step toward me. He just stared at me. His face expressed disbelief and profound disappointment. I walked up to him and asked in a whisper, You don't recognize me? I'll meet you outside in five minutes, he said, and turned his back to me. I shuffled through the crowd and waited. He came out, grabbed my arm, and marched me rapidly away from the project house. How did you find me, he asked. Hugh, I exclaimed, I've been looking for you since you carried me out of the garage. I'm sorry I did that, he said. A gun was pointed at me. You can't know how badly I've wanted to be with you, I said, almost pleading. You're wrong, he said. I knew. I made a bad mistake when I gave you my address. You mean you left that room because I might find you there, I asked? Yes, Sophie, because you might find me there, he said. Didn't you care at all what happened to me, I asked? Yes, he said slowly. I cared very much what happened to a person I had known, a person I had disliked, distrusted, and feared, if you must know the truth. Why, I asked. Perhaps Alec could explain that to you, he said. I should add that I also admired you at times, with that grudging admiration we sometimes have for something we cannot understand, something we fear. I don't believe your why, Sophie. You cannot possibly be so naive, so blind. First Lem, then Thurston, then Alec kissed the ground you walked on, and you have the nerve to ask me why I feared you? Do you want my honest critique of that fine theatrical performance to which you subjected us, pretending to grovel and crawl in front of your Jose for the benefit of your entire train of admirers? I'm only glad that Thurston and Lem were unable to attend for their sake. I cared, Sophie, at a distance, just as I admired you at a distance. It was you who drove me out of my wits when I was about to start graduate school, you and your sister and her world-changing project. I longed to be where you were, yet far removed from you. Finally, I was driven to join you, but only in spirit. I couldn't do what Alex did to himself. The closest I wanted to get to you was to throw myself into your type of engagement, your project. I found it here, and as soon as I found it, I learned that you and your establishment were indeed part of it, of its foulness. What I found here is simple, unsophisticated people who are discovering what it is to be human. They're discovering it on their own, without seers. I interrupted to ask, what are you doing here then? I'm discovering it with them, Sophie. I'm discovering what it means to be in a society but not of it, what it means to be insulted, excluded, maltreated, and injured. I'm discovering what it means to be a stray dog with human characteristics, and I'm discovering that everything I've learned is as useless to them as it is to me. These are people who are becoming themselves, Sophie, on their own. It's a process in which neither you nor I can help them, a process to which we cannot contribute, a process we can only harm. They can only help themselves and each other. They cannot be helped from outside. I'm not here in order to guide, to help, to contribute, or to interfere or meddle in any way. There's no room here for those who are able to give but not to receive. I'm only here to learn. You don't know me, Hugh, I said. That's all I want. You, Sophie, he said, you don't know who you are or what you want. I've known you to be sincere, once, perhaps twice, always quick-witted, at times even brilliant, brave, even heroic, a rare companion. But please believe me when I tell you I don't need you, Sophie. My new friends don't need you. What you carry inside you, what surrounds you, whether you intend it or not, is all the rot we've started to shed. 
I turned away from him and walked to the bus stop. I didn't shout, nor tremble, nor cry, but my heart was broken. Yaristan, I hope you won't think I'm being flippant when I tell you I experienced that bus ride as a second ocean voyage away from you. I came ever so close to what I had always sought, human beings discovering themselves in each other, deriving from each other the will to found the world anew. I came ever so close to what I've learned to call a human community, and I was inexplicably hurled out of it, down to a limbo of interminable days in a fiberglass factory and comfortless nights in a rodent-infested room. What I came so close to, Yaristan, was not the bureaucratic world of Minister Vera, Secretary Adrian, and Representative Mark. It was you, Yaristan, your world, at least the world I've dreamed of building alongside you and alongside living humanity. That's what I recognized, what I found so familiar in Hugh's engagement, in his project house. But that dream had gotten buried so deep inside me. No, not a corpse, Yaristan, but a live desire, an urgent yearning. It had fallen so far below the surface that Hugh couldn't see it. He only saw the rot that had encrusted itself over it during the intervening ten years. It's my sixth long day on this letter, and I still haven't told you everything I wanted to. If I go on, it'll be forever before I hear from you again, and I don't want to wait that long to learn what else is happening where you are and what else you experienced after the uprising in Magarna. I haven't told you about the conversation Sabina and I had as we read your letter in the park. I'll have to tell you next time. Because I've confessed so much already, I can't keep myself from repeating one of my confessions. I love you, Yaristan. I'll never stop loving you. If I've loved Louisa less than she deserved, it's because I've never forgiven her for taking me with her on that ocean voyage to this desert. But I'm not flying to you. I'm staying here. Not because I'm afraid I'd bring all my rot. I don't believe I carry only rot. But because I love you too, Myrna, for everything that you've been to him. And I love you, Yara, for being what you are. And you too, Yasna, for being exactly what you've been. Your Sophia.